Birdie Boy Productions is super excited because the blue-eyed Mexican Shane Torres' first stand-up special is on YouTube right now. Check it out. It's on Shane Torres' channel and Burt Kreischer's channel, The Blue-Eyed Mexican. I hope you like it. We're so proud of it. There's a link in the description below. Check it out on YouTube now. I have my dad's legs and I don't have to, people are like, what's your workout? And I'm like, my dad came inside my mom in 1983 <laughs> and I have a half a dad bod. Thank You're you. someone I wish I knew better, Nikki. Well, this is what we're doing. I know, right? Um, what are you promoting? Uh, F-Boy Island. Yes. Um, tell me what that is. I am so, I, I kind of know, but tell me anyway. I am new to this like batch. Are we recording? Yeah. So I'm on, on. Okay. Yeah. So F-Boy Island, like, I totally <laughs> changed. F-Boy Island is, it's um, three girls looking for love and they go to an island. Mm -hmm. We shot it here. And um, there's all these guys that are there that are like, you know, they're, they're suitors. And half of them are F-Boys, which are just guys that are there to get the cash prize at the end if they get chosen. It's $100,000. And then the other half of the guys are really like nice guys that actually want a relationship and are there for the right reasons. But they all are lying and saying that they are there for the right reasons. And the girls have to decipher who is who. And so there's like guys on the show who are saying like, you know, like you always watch a reality show and you know who might not be there for the right reasons. You kind of speculate. But on our show, people are just straight up villains and say like, I don't like these girls at all. And I'm just here for the money. And there'll be guys that get to the very end. And these girls... They'll have, you know, been intimate. They will have been, you know, courting each other for weeks and like truly falling in love and crying over how they feel about this person. They will eliminate some nice guy that like would have been there forever for them to pick this guy. And the guy just, um, when they when they ch are chosen, when an F boy is chosen, all the money that the girl was in control of goes to him. And then he decides whether to split it with her and like reform mm -hmm. and say, actually, I'm not an F boy anymore. I actually like you or keep it all for himself. And we've had guys just like, you know, seconds before pleading, like, I have changed. I came here as an F boy, but you've convinced me that I want to settle down and you've made me open up and I've never felt this way about anyone. And then they go, okay, yeah, I choose you. And they go, I'm actually lying. I'm going to keep it all. And sorry. Wow. And it's, it's brutal. And so it's just really fun because you play along watching, like, you know, who's there for the wrong reason. So you're like screaming at your TV, like, don't choose him. And then some guys, we don't tell you who, what they are. And so you kind of don't know. So it's, we give away some of the people's statuses and the other ones we don't, it's just fun. And I host it and it's like the greatest job I've ever had. You love it? Yeah, because I just go, I have, first of all, I'm off the road. So I'm like on location and I'm, you know, I, that's always nice to have a reason to not be on the road because I have the same illness Bert has yep. of just like needing to work all the time. And so when I'm shooting a show, it's just like, I have a little glimpse of like a normal life, I right? guess, because I can't go out and do stand up every right. single night. I mean, right. I did this time because we were in LA and we weren't on an island like we have been in the past. But, um, but yeah, it was, it's, and I just get to watch a reality show uh, which is what I like to do anyway. And I just get to comment on it and make fun of it. And and you look beautiful. And I look beautiful. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. do. You look beautiful. I, Every time I see you, I'm like, she's so freaking beautiful. That's so nice. They There's so much work that goes into that. And it's that's like an exhausting thing to keep up. Like it, it was a dream always of like being someone on TV who people go, wow, she's so pretty. And like, I've achieved that in some ways. And- you know, I I don't I don't I, I'm I'm trying to be better when people give me compliments like that. So please don't think anyone watching think that I think I'm hot or whatever. It's hard for me to even say that I'm closing my eyes at that idea. Of it. <laughs> but it it takes so much work. And once you achieve it where it's like, oh, you're fuckable on camera. It's like now it's about you keep that and don't ever because I return for, you know, first season of the show is 35 and now I'm 39. Like. I can see my face is falling. Theirs aren't like they stay the same age <laughs> and I get older and it's getting, it's getting uncomfortable to like, you know, see myself on camera and all of that stuff. It's just the upkeep is a lot. It's such an interesting world, isn't it? That world yeah. of being on camera all the it's, time. I think that it's, you know, I, I talk to my girlfriends. We have this ongoing girls chat with like 10 of my girlfriends from all parts of my life, high school, through college, through you know starting standup. So it's all different people. And um, only a couple of, of us are in show business. And we're the ones that struggle the most with aging and 
our faces and our bodies. And because it's, I have to constantly look at pictures of myself and approve images and look at footage. And, you know, we're not meant to, to examine our selves like this so much. I, if it were up to me, I would never look at a picture of myself or it'd be once a year for a Christmas card. You know, like that used to be the way I knew it. Like my mom would talk about the Christmas card photo and hate herself one time a year. And I would hear that like, oh, I look so fat. Oh, that's so ugly. But that's my, that's my, a voice I have to have like every day, oh, you know? Forget it. And, and when I feel great, it's, I don't even let it in because I go, well, it's, fake eyelashes and it's hair extensions and it's a spray tan and it's a stylist. And, um, and so you can't even take credit for it. And even if I wanted to, I will say that because there are some things about me that, um, I sometimes feel like Bert when I say, uh, uh, with his Mickey Mantle gene of like, he's like a natural born athlete. Some things you're just born with, like when it comes to looks, yep. some things you really like try hard. I'm, I'm a mixture of trying very hard, like a lot of fake stuff. And then like I have really good legs and I just do because my dad, I have my dad's legs and I don't have to, people are like, what's your workout? And I'm like, my dad came inside my mom in 1983 <laughs> and I got most of his Worked out great DNA. For me, yeah, right? I got his leg DNA. I have a dad, I have a half a dad bod. So um, yeah, so even the things that I'm like, I was born with it. I don't even take credit for that. I'm like, oh, my dad's, I didn't do anything. It's, 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 yeah. It, but I don't you know. work out, right? Here and there. Here and like, there. it's like, you know, this week, not at all because yeah. I've been doing press and I get hair and makeup done at six in the morning and then you don't want to sweat it off. Mm -mm. And so that gives you an excuse to not work out. Sweat it off. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm a little bit like bird in that respect of like, I'm full on working out or I just don't do anything at all. Like, right. you know, one extreme or the other. Do you play sports growing up? Not at all. No. I, I tried, you know, I wanted to because that's what you did. And that's how, um, that was just, it looked cool, but I was just never coordinated. It wasn't my thing. It was, it seemed to me, I had, um, just a, a deficiency there and I, it made me feel really insecure. So I never liked PE. I always wanted to go to the nurse's office, like anything, any balls flying, like whenever even guys are like tossing something around and I'm like in the room and I'm like, please don't toss it to me. Cause it'll just be like, oh, and I'll make some face like this. And, and people will go like, how did you not catch that? Like, it's just, I like to be in control. I like to do things uh, I'm good at and I'm not good at sports. But the older I get, the more comfortable I am with the things I'm bad at though. So I, I think now I'm not as terrified of sports. I'm just not not as interested. But um, no, I've, as soon as I found like theater, I was like, thank God, something that I can do instead of the field hockey athletics. team. Athletics. Yeah, because I did yeah. field hockey, but I would just, my field hockey coach, years later, she came to a show and she was like, I never met anyone who, wanted to be on the bench more than you. Like, I just wanted to be on the sides, like yeah. with my girlfriends, cheering them on, yeah. wearing the cute field hockey skirt. But I didn't want to, I don't want to go in there and disappoint people. Yeah. I don't like team sports because right. it's too much pressure. I I was a good swimmer. I'm a good skier. So I'm good at, I'm a good runner, but uh, team sports, no, that's too much. I, I wouldn't be good at imp any kind of improv thing too. Like anything team where it's like people are relying on me, crowd work even. I feel like it's too... I can't, maybe it's like, I don't trust other people, but I think I don't trust myself to, to, um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I just like that. I think that's why I like stand up. It's just, it's just me. It's I don't rely on anyone you, else. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Cause, um, yeah, seeing you, team sports as a parent, I made my kids play a team yeah. sport for a little bit for that exact reason. Yeah. I was like, you have to be able to disappoint a group of people and know <laughs> yes. that you're still okay. Yes. Like, it's okay. It's, yes. It's okay. If you strike out at the plate, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. That's really a good lesson because I just, I didn't get that memo until really late in life. Oh, they didn't okay. enjoy it. No, but they, it, they didn't like it. They still are. are well, I love pretty much, um, we made, we made her, we made her play softball. And she was really naturally really good at it. Yeah. And I just had no interest in wow. no interest whatsoever. It was like, whatever, I could give two actual shits about the sport. And then we like, so, well, okay, I've tried golf, even though it's kind of singular, mm -hmm. no interest at all either. Um, but yeah, I, I was determined because I didn't grow up playing sports either. You didn't? No. Oh, you seem so I sporty. Didn't. I think I am actually really athletic, but because yeah. of my um, home life, I moved so much. I went to right. six different schools oh in 12 grades. Oh, my God. And my parents were divorced and single parents did not have time 
money, energy, resources for me to play any sports. So I just didn't. Um, Neither of my parents grew up playing sports. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't, you know, we're from a really small town. Yeah. You played football or, or softball and that's it. And my parents just didn't have any kind of background in that. Yes. So it got lost on me. I think now as an adult, and when I work out and when I do stuff, I'm like, shit, I w- I'm actually an athlete. Yeah. But just never had an outlet. I loved PE. I couldn't wait for PE. Really? Yes, I loved it. Oh, wow. Loved it. I was a cheerleader. Okay. but And that's kind of athletic. And what do you do now to work out? Like, what's your favorite stuff to do? I work out three days a week with a trainer. Mm-hmm. And I freaking love the guy. He is, he is insane. He is the... Um, he is the trainer for the beach volleyball Olympic teams. Oh my god! So he's uh, his one he's of his lots of squats. pair yeah. has a lot of squats. One of the women's pair just won world championship oh, like wow. last week. Whoa! I mean, he's a legit crazy trainer. And is it like an hour long? It's an hour. And I know with a friend. Do you want to die at some parts of it? Uh, yes. Is it that kind of workout? Yes. Yeah. It's awful. Uh huh. At the he'll show us. I'll show up, and the volleyball players will already be working out. So I'll see oh, what I'm about there. to do. Oh, oh yeah. God. The six foot four. <laughs> 20 something year old. Women yeah. and the six foot seven men are up before me with zero body fat. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my God. They're like wrapped in four rubber bands, suspended from a bar, doing like knee ups. There's no, fu- there's no way that's my workout. There's no way I'm going to be doing that. And then it's my turn and he goes, all right, let's get you in the rubber bands. We're going to hang you from the spin. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's no way I'm doing this. And in the middle of it, I'll go, I can't believe that I'm doing this. But you weren't doing it right away. Like it took you a while to get Mm -hmm. to that point where, but that's my problem as I look at something, I go, I'll never be able to do that. I can't see... Uh, even though I know from doing stand up, you start out and you suck and you do it over and over and you get better. Like I've seen that example in my life. I just, if I'm not good at something right away, I'm just want to give up. And it's, it's really hard to. Then how'd you muscle through stand up? Because I was naturally a little bit good at it. You know, mm-hmm. like I was a little bit better than everyone who just started out. Like, and I got a lot of positive feedback of like, this is kind of your thing. Like mm-hmm. it was the first time in my life I felt like I was good at something. And, and that's what's funny to me about hearing about Isla being good at softball or, or, or golf and not wanting to just run with that because that's all I wanted as a kid was someone to be like, you're better than everyone at this thing. And I'd never, you know, I was good. At, I was smart and got good grades, but not, you know, not valedictorian level. Like it was always like kind of above average, but I wanted to be the best at something. And right. I, I think stand up was the first time I was like, oh, I could be the best at this or I could get close to it. I could be an elite um, comic. And, uh, but I also knew, and I compared myself to people at my level. I wasn't like looking ahead too much. I I feared ahead, you know, like I feared, like, how could you do 45 minutes on stage? That kind of thing. And I only have five, but I just, and and I, I, I think it was just logical. I remember telling my parents, give me, seven years to like have a career in this and make my own money. Like, will you just please support me until then? And then I promise you it's going to pay off and I'll be supporting you. And they really were like seven years, but it's like, yeah, that's what it takes. But I think it's just an interesting kind of uh, profession within show business that you can't start until you're like 18. So everyone starts at 18, a total novice or around that age. And it takes you 10 years to get good. But, you know, by the time you're 18, and if you're a singer or an actress, you could have been doing it since you were five. So totally. you've got those, close to those 10,000 hours. But we all as comedians start as adults. Mm-hmm. And I, there's something I like about that because, um, yeah, it's it, it, there, you can't really get a head start as a kid on right. stand-up. In fact, if you do, it's weird and you're probably just doing it because your dad wanted to do stand-up. And so you're like reading jokes he wrote for you and you, you, <laughs> that you're you not going to be one. Like kids doing stand-up, it doesn't really work. No. Yeah. No. They don't so, have enough life experience anyway to talk about anything. Yeah. That's, I didn't even at 18, I was just like talking about what I am. I just wrote jokes imagining like if I was Sarah Silverman, what would I say? Or I like wrote jokes for her because I was like, I've never had sex. Like all the things I was talking about, all the things I still do talk about, I hadn't even like experienced before. Um but yeah, it was just it was just the first thing I was good at. And uh yeah. And Why'd you try it? What because try it? people were just kept telling me you should do stand up comedy. And I never considered it. And I was watching Seinfeld the other day and I was like, Seinfeld was the, the biggest part of my life growing up. I was like, it's kind of my identity around eighth grade is when I think the last season was. I remember my teacher 
Um, my algebra teacher, we had a test on Friday and Thursday was the Seinfeld finale, the series finale. And he let me take the test on Monday because he knew that Thursday I would be too wrapped up in the finale like oh to, to study. Like that's how much of a Seinfeld fan I was. But not at any point when I watched Seinfeld did I go, I should be a stand-up comedian. Like I watched this guy who is the main character is a stand-up comedian. There was no even... I, there was there wasn't even a like, glimmer of an idea that I would do stand up. It was just I wanted to be an actress or I wanted to be a performer. There was no part of me that was like I'll be on SNL. I just was. I didn't think about comedy. I loved comedy, but I didn't think of stand up as a profession that maybe as a woman I could do. I don't really know what it was, but um, but as soon as someone suggested it to me, I was like, and I was pretty desperate at that time when it was suggested to me of like, what the fuck am I going to do? Because I'm not a good actress. I'm not a good enough actress that I'm just getting things easily. And I'm not a good good enough singer that that's coming easy. And I knew I wanted to be a performer. So I was like, I was kind of just ready to... I was honestly like, I guess I'm going to have to kill myself someday. Like I was starting <laughs> to think about how am I going to kill myself? Did like, you I'm, really? Oh yeah, like because... I didn't want to be a teacher. Like whatever I would have ended up being, I probably would have been a teacher um, because there's some performance in that. Uh And so I would have just, I just, I didn't want to be anything else. And, um, And it just felt like a huge failure on my part that this thing that I'd always dreamed of doing, even though I had no real plan for it, I just thought like, Oh, by the time I'm, by the time I'm in high school, I'll be doing commercials. Then I'll move to LA right out of college, and then I'll be get a sitcom. I kind of like thought my life would go the way Jennifer Aniston's did, and when it wasn't panning out that way, I was like, "Well, I guess I'll just die. Like I have to die at some point." <laughs> I well, really it. did. It's over, I, and that's the, 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 still the way I think. Like I really have these like. I don't, I don't go there anymore. I, but my mind will try to go there. Of like, well, you should just kill yourself because you failed at that thing that you wanted and you're a failure. And what's the point of your life? And so, um, what luckily- do you think that's about? Wife of the Party is sponsored by Better Help. You know, I've talked about this many times. I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I've been in therapy for years. Therapy helps me in every area of my life, in my business, in my relationship, in my friendships, and being a parent. I think therapy is the greatest gift you can give yourself. This is a holiday season, time for gift giving. You know, don't leave yourself off the list. Give yourself the gift of knowing yourself better, of handling your relationships better, of therapy. And BetterHelp is a great way to do that for yourself. Hey, holidays are hard. And wouldn't it be nice to be in therapy when old Aunt Rose comes over and tweaks all your issues and triggers everything from your past life, uh, just to be able to go to your therapist and say, hey, she's driving me crazy. It's a safe place for you to get things off your chest. I do that all the time with my therapist. I find it invaluable. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash wife today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash wife. Wife of the Party is sponsored by AG1. I drink AG1 every single morning. I get up in the morning and I have a blend jet. I don't know if you have one of these, but I have a little blend jet. It's a teeny tiny blender. I fill it with water. I add my AG1 and I blend it because it, I like it really smooth. Sometimes I put a little protein powder in there. Sometimes I put a banana in there. I first gave AG1 a try because I was having stomach trouble and my doctor recommended that I add it into my daily routine. And I have, I've never felt better. Um, And it's just been become part of my daily life. Since drinking AG1 daily, my stomach issues have gone. I'm sure they were a huge contributor to that happening. I feel so much better. You know, tummy trouble stinks. And anything that kind of balances your tummy is good. good. It makes everything in your day better. Not only does AG1 deliver my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics and more, but it's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. It is the best nutritional supplement. It is like foundational nutrition. There's so many greens, there's probiotics, there's antioxidants. 
It's just a great way to start your day. I literally have one every single morning. I love AG1. Here is your chance to start every day this season with a gift to yourself. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash wife. That's drinkag1.com slash wife. Check it out. I don't, I don't go there anymore, I, but my mind will try to go there of like, well, you should just kill yourself because you failed at that thing that you wanted and you're a failure and what's the point of your life? And so, um, what luckily- What do you think that's about? Just, I don't know, like low self, obviously low self-esteem, like um, having, just feeling like I, I was born, like I'm a, like I was born defective. Like I'm, what's the point of my life if I can't do the things I want to do and uh, that it's a waste of a life. And so I should just like cut it off and stop consuming things, like stop, you know, taxing our earth's resources with my existence if I'm not doing what I really want to do. It's, I mean, so stupid because now stand-up could go away. My career could go away and I would find a purpose. I would like start an animal rescue. Like I have things I'm passionate about mm-hmm. as much as performing, mm-hmm. even maybe more so. Um, so I, I, but if, if you, t- I don't know, I, it's, I, I go to that so quickly of like, well then, you know, if I'm having like a bad day, I'm just like, I should just kill myself. Like I, I don't, let that thought go any further, but it is a first thought I think of. And it's it used to freak out everyone in my life. I mean, I kept it to myself most of my life. My first thoughts of that were like fourth grade of like, oh God, I'm going to have to kill myself. Like, like if this boy finds out I wet the bed, if it, at this part, like I remember this one day I was praying. I didn't even believe in God, but I had wet the bed at my friend's house and she was, and there was a girl there that wasn't my friend. And I knew, and she told the class that I wet the bed and I knew that if it traveled with me from third grade to fourth grade, like this rumor that um, if this one boy, Tyler Schoonover, if you're out there, Tyler if, if Tyler Schoonover found out that I wet the bed and there was this one day that I knew they were going to work together on a project or something and I knew she would tell him, I was like, if he's at school tomorrow, he's going to find out and I have to kill myself. And I was in fourth grade and it's really sad for me to think that I had that thought, but I really, it was just like, I can't go on if he knows. And I prayed to God the night before, which I had never done in my life. And the next day he, he was sick and he didn't come into school and they didn't work on the project together. And I totally, like I survived it. But I remember having those wild thoughts um, really early. And it makes me so sad to think about. Um, I would not have would survived even, social media. Where would you come up with that? Like, did you know someone who killed no. himself? No, I, but I've, I've looked into, because I've suffered with these ideations so much, I've read a lot about it and like, because I'm trying to figure out like what's either wrong with me or maybe I can find well, there's nothing's something wrong kind of, with you, but that yeah, but it's, it's like a unique it's, way. What's of going on? Coping. It's a coping yeah. mechanism somehow. But there's kids that like start ideating on this early on, and like it just no one. I don't know where I got it from. I mean, I, obviously, I knew about death, and I knew oh. that. And it was. I think it's a sense of control. I still kind of joke about that. Like, you know, you're not allowed to kill yourself, but. You just have to wait for God to be like, here's cancer. And you're like, that's not fair. Like I want DIY. Like I, I'm, I want to do it myself. I want control of the situation. Um, but yeah, it was, a. I had those thoughts. Like I just, you know, all through, uh, my adolescence and then into even now, even to today, not today, but like, you know, presently, Presently, I just, I, I have little glimmers of it. And, um, and it's so annoying because <laughs> it's like no amount of success or, you know, my family's all health, healthy and happy. Like, I'm like, what if something really fucked up happens in my life? Like, where am I going to go? Luckily, I have like a, I have plans to, not to kill myself, but like to get out of doing it. You know, like <laughs> you I'm never going to do it. Nuts. I never want to do it. First but. of all, I've talked about it so much. It would be so embarrassing to do it because the compilations people could make of these podcasts where I've talked about this, it, everyone would be like, the writing was on the wall. Right. With finally. the blood splatter. She finally. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Like, God just do it already. Stop talking I mean, about it. Thank God I don't read comments about myself, but I'm sure <laughs> most of them are like, do it, bitch. We're tired of hearing you talk about no, it. None of them are that. But but they're I'll, close to it. But I'll tell you though, <laughs> being married to Bert, I don't think he thinks about that. He's too Catholic to think about yeah. killing himself. Oh, right. The Catholic, you can't mm. do that. You know. Yes. But- he thinks about then my life is over. 
Like everything is so, is catastrophe thinking almost. Yes. It's a I, catastrophe thinker. I think you're right. I think, mm. okay. So it seems like Bert and I are kind of on the same level there. Whereas I wasn't raised Catholic. I didn't, I didn't have that shame or like a thought about, I, I don't think I'm going to burn it in hell if I kill myself. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it's, so, it's yeah. complete sound. But it is He's catastrophizing. It. It's yes, like, I, I, my life will be over if this one thing doesn't go right. And if I lose... Um, but it, and it's so funny to me because he has like such a great family. Like uh-huh. if his fame went away, he has this incredibly successful family he's built. Like let alone his his, his family is more impressive than his career. Even you know like right. What what, what well, I see? You. That's yeah, nice. absolutely. I mean, you guys are go- goals, and I only know it from the outside. So whatever. But like, I think you guys are pretty honest, and and um and what I see is probably what what. It's it's what I would want in within a family, but we still are that delusional that um, we seek approval from strangers, even though it doesn't even we don't even let it in when it's it's good good. But he seems to let it in. I feel like things their shows that mean something to him, Red Rocks. He let yeah. that in. Yeah. He, oh, he's much better. He's mm-hmm. as as life has gone on, yes. like you're saying. Yes, he's gotten better. But I know in the beginning. When we were first together, we've been together 23 years. We were first together. He would say things and I'd be like, wow. I mean, that's deep and dark and wide and all encompassing. And you just didn't get the right Starbucks order, dude. I mean, it's like, we're not, we're not solving world hunger here. We're telling a couple jokes. Yes. And, and those are important and valuable and amazing, but my life is over is not accurate. So no, it's not. And it's not helping you. It's making you feel worse to talk to yourself that way. Oh, I don't know so if that's logical. No, you said like- I'm way too logical. No, it's, it's, no, it's what we need, people like us. We need people to ground us and kind of go, what are, what are you talking about? And, and you're not someone who's craving people's approval. You don't strike me as someone. No. And that is so refreshing to someone like us to be around and to balance us out. Um, and you're very non-judgmental. So mm-hmm. you seem, you don't look at him and go, what is wrong? Like, you're not, you're just like, come on, like, let's look at this logically, but you don't shame us about that. Um, but it's gotta be so, it's so foreign to you to see well, someone it's feel foreign, that way. I have to tell you with Bert, I think probably with you too, it's why you're a comic. Yeah. It's one is not without the other. I agree. So why would you ever say stop doing that? Because mm-hmm. stopping doing that stops the other parts yes. of your brain that aren't, it's not, I don't want to say it's not normal, but it's not typical. Yes. Right? Comics don't have a t- typical brain. They don't have a typical point of view. Uh, they don't have a, uh, all of their experiences are filtered through something that's different mm-hmm. than just normies. Yes. You know, all of us normies who my logical, linear, pragmatic brain doesn't take an organ, ordinary situation and make it humorous. Right. We don't. I don't. I, yeah. I, I make a, I mean, a humorous situation is humorous. Yeah. But Bert can take the simplest thing of like, you know, one of his jokes is about Isla putting her deodorant in the refrigerator. Mm-hmm. She really did that. Yeah. Like, she really did that. That sounds soothing. Uh, well, she, you know why she would do it? She would... She would do it because she wanted it to be cold. She was in middle school and she would, before school, take it out of the fridge, swipe her finger on the top and then rub it under her nose. Wait, why? So that she couldn't smell other people's body odor. She's so smart. Right? And I watch it and go, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Why would you do that? You're not going to build it into the- Acne. What what are you doing Mm -hmm. to your face? And Bert goes, brilliant, and built a whole joke around it. Yes. Well, do you feel though, because I feel like- I can I obviously can make light and and be humorous about really not funny situations or things that people wouldn't look at it that way. But I can also take things so seriously. Do you feel? And I think oh, De- yeah. Bert strikes me as someone that can be almost unhumorously serious about something yes. and 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 like take really it personally. Yes, and and where you're like, wait, let's have a little bit of levity here because I think sometimes. I mean, I would go into therapists and they're like, you're the least funny person I've ever met in my life. And I'm like, uh, uh, I'm not trying to kill in here, but they're like, you need to have more lightness in your life. And I think that that's an interesting thing about comedians is that we're known for making things so funny, but we also are so serious about everything. And um, 
and aren't very light about stuff and can't like just brush stuff off and move on. And I think that's what we ruminate. And so then we eventually find a way to take control of the thing that we don't have control over by making fun of it. That's right. Yeah. It's, that's, it's, that's right. But <sighs> it's intensity, really. Intensity. Yes. It's intensity about everything. That's exactly the, the yeah. that that resonates with me. I've, I've always been told I'm an intense person and yeah. like, whoa, dude. And like, just the way I move, the way I act like fast and like harsh. And like, uh, I think my whole life, there was, I think there's a lot of shame around being like not delicate and not feminine and not soft and like not, like when I sit on a couch, I plop and like, my dad's always like, Jesus Christ, you just plop on things. And like uh, my mom being like, you can't have nice things because you ruin them because you're just too rough. I put on a shirt and I'm like, ah! I put on lotion on my face and I'm just like hurting myself. Like everything is done so intensely yeah. and, and punitively. Huh. Um, you the only child? No, I have a sister. I have a younger sister. Similar at all? No. She, I mean, she's really funny. Um uh, and she's really non-judgmental and like, like in that way, like that's how we're similar, I think. But she is, um, she doesn't crave the spotlight and thank fucking God. Right. Because I would not, she's very talented. And if she would have pursued that, she'd be more successful than me for sure. She just didn't crave that, you know, as much. And I'm so grateful because I would not be a good Solange Knowles, like to Beyonce, you know, like this lesser famous sister. I no. wouldn't be able to handle that. No. And she's really cool about it, um, about, you know, my parents like are really psyched about my career. I get a lot of attention from them for it. They're and adorable. And she's had, they're so cute. They're and she's adorable. had three kids and has this like amazing family. And the stuff she, she's a teacher, the stuff she does is impressive, but it's not exciting. So if I were her, I would be so jealous of the attention I get from my parents, but she's just like so supportive and so psyched about it. And like, she just doesn't need that external validation, but she was also popular in high school. She was popular. She was popular all the time. And, um, and, but and she didn't even not? care about it then. She wasn't like trying to be popular. She just was, you know, and I think I've always been trying. I've been like thirsty How and hu funny. hungry for like someone please like me. Oh, I wish I was like one of the cool girls. And, um, now I, I, I think that's always in me to like want cool people to like me, but I've kind of, I, I think I am cool now. I'm like, okay, if I could, I think I'm okay with who I am now most of the time. But um, yeah, I had a huge complex growing up about my sister just being so like effortlessly. Is she younger? Cool and pretty. Yeah, she's, she's younger. younger. And she's like a naturally beautiful person. And- but so are you. I wasn't in high school. Like it was, it was, I was just a little bit more awkward. Just the way some people are. You're just, yeah. you know, just a late bloomer. I wasn't, um, I just didn't get the boys' attention. Not that I wanted it. I actually actively didn't want it, but I wanted the girls' attention of like the popular girls, yeah. you know, liking me. And and to get that attention, you had to be desirable to boys. So I found I just, you know, I wanted that value of being attractive and being cool. And it just didn't come naturally to me. Like I had frizzy hair. Hair straighteners were not as powerful back then as they are now. They were just like, it, it, there wasn't, there weren't the methods. I didn't know how to look good. And now I do because I've been in this business long enough and had hair and makeup done that I can like look pretty good and right. take it up a couple notches. But back then I really struggled with my looks and uh, yeah, it was just, it just felt unfair. You know, I felt it's so ridiculous because I'm born able-bodied and, you know, without any, you know, I have mental illness, but that's about it. But I was still so scornful of my parents for making me. Uh, I used, my mom used to get so mad. I'd be like, why did you and dad have sex knowing that you could possibly, you have like people in your family that are ugly and you knew these genes were floating around to make me. Oh my And I'm so ugly. And my mom would go, you shut up up. We're tired of hearing this. You are not ugly. You be happy with what God gave you, which is never what I wanted to hear because all I wanted to hear was you're beautiful. But also I didn't want to hear that because I knew it wasn't true. I'm like, but no one wants to fuck me. So like, obviously I'm not. So it was, there's no winning with me. I was a very like angry child about the hand I had been dealt, even though it's like the luckiest hand ever because I have the greatest family and was born into privilege and, you know, all the things. But I was still was just, why is Lauren pretty? Why did you, you create her? And then also like, how could this have happened? <laughs> how did this happen? <laughs> how, why would you take this risk given your family tree? I was like so mad at them. And, um, and then do it again. 
And then do it again. Yeah. yeah right. And then do it again. And and yeah, of course she gets like, uh, like it felt like, you know, I, f- yeah. I, I, it's I, so I, interesting, Nikki, because <sighs> I only know you as you the past probably, I don't know, five years or so. Yeah, I've known yeah. You. I think you're just drop dead, gorgeous, beautiful, not just because of what you look like, but because of who you are. Thanks. I love your stand up. Thanks. I love your energy. Thanks. I love your supportiveness and positivity to other people in this industry. Yeah. You're just a really Thank solid you. human being. You're like text to me when like I have a special out or like after we spend some time together, like have always meant so much to me. Like Aww. your your approval is the popular girl's approval that I never got back in the cafeteria. It really feels really good. And I'm and yeah, I mean, I, 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 I really appreciate hearing all of that because I do, I do feel like I'm a good person, and like I, um, and I, it's nice to be to hear those things about myself, and I'm gonna let it in and thank you. And I don't, and you know, I talk so much about feeling insecure about my looks, but I think it's just, um, it's not like I don't want any, I don't want anyone watching. To, I mean. I talk about it all the time. So people are like, shut up about being ugly. But it's just like a common, it's just something that happened in adolescence right. that I can't get over. It's like yeah. the fat kid that gets skinny and you go, why would you ever think you're fat? And they're Because it, they just got told it one day in right. middle school. Right. Like one boy called me ugly in middle school. And that's, that's just my story now. Yeah. And, um, but, um, no, and but yeah, I think but it's uh, good not for after people. I get my brow lift. What? Oh, I'm gonna get. What's a bra lift? <laughs> a brow lift. Oh, I thought you said a bra lift. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? That, I, that's probably Just gonna be a new tighten thing. your straps. Yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> a, a bra lift. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get. I'm gonna start doing like surgical stuff at some point. Uh, I don't know when. Um, yeah, and you do. Yeah, that yeah. That makes think- me nervous. You know why? I've just started watching. Um, Botch. Uh, no, uh, no, just a TV show with a lot of mature women on it. Yeah. And every single woman has had, oh, not every single, Golden. I would say 95% of yeah. the women have had something done. Yes. And I don't like it. I go, you all look the same. They now do. you all look exactly the same. Mm-hmm. There's no uniqueness to anyone here. Yeah. And that's the, that's my note is that for me, I don't want to look like, anything other than me. Yes. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. So don't make you look like anything other than you. Yeah, I would just, yeah, I would still want them to keep my... You. Yes, I wouldn't want to look so... I wouldn't, I don't think I'd change my nose or anything, but just like, just lift in a way that I'm like, oh, it's like me when I was 28. You know, like, I just want to get back to the what I was before, I guess. I don't know. But there is... That's chasing a dragon though, man, because at oh, a certain yeah. point, you're just gonna have to keep doing it. Keep doing oh, it. Oh, I know. And do you really want to be 80 looking like you're 28? I don't know. I don't I know. know. If the, well, the inside outside don't match. But it's, I mean, Leanne, there's still like, Bert's even participated in podcasts where they're rating like, who's the hottest female comic? Like there's still these it's pressures so to be I get it. attractive to men, even though I don't care about male comics fucking me. No, I get and I've, it. I've done that. <laughs> you know, like yeah. there's still that like she has more value because she's fuckable, even to male comics about female comics who they know you, they they are they know our value. That male comics don't think female. Most of them don't think female comics, including Bert, are worse than male comics. Like we we all know we're all equal. It's maybe more outsiders that think female comics aren't as funny, right? Um, but it's still even. You know, I hear about those, you know, unreleased podcasts talking about in the the ranking of like who's hottest among these guys. And they talk and it's like even that kind of and I shouldn't care about locker room talk and they're entitled to it. I mean, I talk about the same shit like we, we all can be shallow and judgmental. Yeah, totally. And it's one of the best things about being a comedian is talking shit with other comics about other comics about things they can't control. <laughs> but um, but there's still those things that it's like, oh, I, you know, I think that's that's the point is like being. No, like when I started comedy, I was young and pretty. And that felt like, oh, that's why I got things. And I always knew that I was funny, but it was like, okay, but the, a percentage of this is because men want to have sex with me. Mm. And I think I still think that there are certain jobs I get where I'm like, well, I can think of a comedian who's not as fuckable as me. And I don't think that she maybe would have gotten this job. You know, like I can point to things I've gotten and think, I, and it's not every job. I mean, most jobs I would say funniness rules out. Like, uh, but I I think in this business, being fuckable matters so much. And I wish it didn't. But yeah. there's there's something about that I want to hold on to because you know 
I don't think we'd know who Lizzo was if she had the talent of like Hillary Duff. You know, like you got to be so talented to be a bigger person or like a less standardly attractive person. You have to be the best. And I'm I'm good, but I'm not the best. <laughs> and so I'm like, OK, well, I got to retain this other thing like you. I'm this good at comedy. I got to be this hot, too. And then if I stack them all up, then I can keep my career. But it will go away eventually is the the good news. We all have to resign ourselves to being to to looking old and being old and you can't run away from it forever or you d the, the answer is dying young is the only way to avoid it and I have no plan on that so I have to at some point let go and accept it yeah and and I will I really I think talking about it so much um helps me uh make peace with it I think. and process and it take yeah. control yeah mm -hmm. it helps you process it you ruminate like you said yeah. And uh, I live with someone who has talked about his sobriety at fucking nauseam mm -hmm. since he got sober. And not that he's staying sober, but he's sure. currently sober. Yeah. And it is all he talks about all mm -hmm. day, every day when we are by ourselves. In what way does he talk about it? Oh, well, is this the right thing for me? Is this not the right thing for me? When am I going to drink? Do I even have to drink again? What am I going to drink if I'm going to drink again? Why would I drink again? If I'm going to drink again, how long am I going to drink again? In what capacity am I drinking again? Mm -hmm. What do you think about me drinking again? My kids don't want me to drink again. I'm going to be like, it is constant. Yeah. Because that's what's in his brain. Yes. It's all it's the it's obsession. Just, it's the same exact thing. Um, it's so funny. I don't, I feel like I don't know well, I do know a lot of male comics, but there are things about you and there are things about Whitney that are exactly like Bert. Yes. Which I find really fascinating. Yeah. More so than men I know in the world of comedy. Mm. Bert is more like you and Whitney than he is like any guy. Bert has a comedy. very feminine side to him. Yeah. He's sensitive. Yep. And he's emotional. Yep. And uh, he takes things personally. Yep. And he cares yeah. about what he looks like. And he's, yeah, he's obsessive. And it's, it, it, that's why I've always really felt close to Bert. And, um, and he's someone who's just like, I mean, Bert's hilarious, but there's the thing I love about him so much is that he's, he's honest and he's, mm. um, and I feel, and he, he's emotionally honest, and yeah. which is a really hard for a lot of men to do. And he's very self-aware, which yes. I think women get too quicker than than men do. And so I think when I first met Bert, I was really taken aback by how he was able to do that. And he felt like, yeah, I, it's it is it's nice to hear that um, because I sense that about him. But the yeah the the drinking thing. I mean, I have the same struggles with drinking and with um, weed and. Um, and just like my, and and weight loss and all the, the obsession of um when can I eat normally again when can I when will I be able to real, not exercise every day like just when the drinking thing has gone away from me but weed sometimes is like when can I do it again when oh should I never do it okay I've been gone this long I want to keep the streak going oh uh, it's I could do it a little bit and it'll help me but then if I do it a lot I'll start forgetting things like it's just constantly juggling this desire to get out of my own head because I think drinking lets Bert get out of this fucking yep. nightmare of like recessive It's thoughts. constant. Yeah. Yeah. It's a constant chatter, I yes. think, in his head. A constant chatter. Yes. My brain doesn't work like that. I don't have a constant chatter. I can't imagine what that must be like. It must on some days be really exciting and inspiring mm -hmm. and creative and like intense and amazing. And on some days it must be exhausting to just want to have a minute of peace. Um, because but I, you can't have that. You can't because have it. You can't he, sit still in peace. You can't sit still. And My therapist told me it's either I, there's like this window. Most people are in this, like this middle ground of like, just like feeling a little bit anxious and then like a little bit sad, but they're kind of like in this, like, it's cool. And people like me and Bert want to be anxious, totally like, I'm on stage, I'm working hard, I'm exhausted, I'm oh, like, oh, I got to do this thing and this thing, and I'm running from place to place and no time to be in this. Or if if we're not in that and like the show's, you know, the, the, the show is wrapped, it's it's time for, to end the show, then we either want to get wasted to go down into sub ob, unconsciousness, yeah. asleep or wasted. Wow. And you, we want to go down because this middle zone is very uncomfortable for us where most people hang out. We're up here all the time or we go straight down there and we like cross over the that little like river. But we don't like to stay in that. We don't like to hang out and wait in it. Like I can imagine Bird on vacation is fine for a little bit, but then he's like, 
let's make a video, <laughs> like, like shirts off, like film me doing this. Like, let's, I got to create something I have to, because my value is creating and push, pushing forward my career. And, yeah. and is that, if or, I sit still, someone's going to get ahead. He didn't think like that. So oh, he much. doesn't. Okay. He's always, the good thing about Bert is he's never really run anybody else's race. He's always been about running his own yeah. race. He's like, I need to sell tickets for my stuff. I'm not doing enough for my stuff. It's always about his own stuff. Right. Um, and he doesn't ever, or at least he doesn't ever say out loud, you know, I'm going to lose this to someone else if I don't keep yeah. it going. Okay. You know, like there's enough room for everybody mm -hmm. in his brain, mm -hmm. which is kind of a great brain. But you're right. We're on vacation. He's either asleep. Uh, he sleeps a lot on vacation. Yeah. Or we are like massively actively doing something. Yes. There's no like, let's lay at the pool. I don't understand laying at the pool. There's either. no like, float I am actually not good at that either. Yeah, it's just like, what do you do? I'm not it's good at too that. Too bright to read and either you're just sitting there. Yeah, it's a lot. You sleep laying you sleep. at the pool. That's yes, what you, you do. do. But yeah, there's not a lot of middle. There's not mm -hmm. a lot of slow. Yeah. But I'm not very slow either. But I don't really live in those highs and lows. I do live in the middle, mm -hmm. but I'm constantly moving. Yes. I'm, I'm never still in the middle, but I don't go, I'm not anxious hardly ever about anything. That's so great. And then I don't really get depressed or yeah. down or low. Not really. Oh. I'm, just, I'm just kind of dead inside. <laughs> no, I don't I'm think just you kind are. Of I'll just bleh, just you don't take anything same, same. too personally. I do not take anything personally hardly really? ever. No. Have you always been that way? Wife of the Party is sponsored by Omaha Steaks. I literally today just sent a box of Omaha Steaks to my dad and to my Uncle Steve. So if you're listening, it's on its way to you. And I used promo code PARTY and I got $30 off. It was awesome. I bought them a box that had steak, pork chops, chicken, and burgers because they eat all of those. And I got them twice-baked potatoes, scalloped potatoes, uh, country-fried steak, and I bought my dad the, the cheesecake sampler and I bought my Uncle Steve the chocolate cake because he doesn't like cheesecake. It is the easiest way to give a gift you know someone will enjoy. The steaks, not just the steaks actually, all of the food I've ever had from Omaha Steaks is exceptional. Uh, but the quality of the steak is really, really unparalleled. It's such a great company. We order from them all the time for our own house but I often send them as a gift because you just can't beat it as a gift. Visit omahasteaks.com and take advantage of 50% off site-wide. Plus, use promo code PARTY at checkout to get that extra $30 off your order. A minimum order may be required. No. Have you always been that way? Um, I, I, I don't, I think so. Do you I, get your feelings hurt? Not much. Um, huh. You know, I think I grew up with a mom who I believe has a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And when you have a parent who is so unpredictable and unstable, you process that one of two ways. One way is you make it really about yourself where you go, I'm really fucking up here and that's making all this happen. Yeah. Or this has nothing to do with me. This is not me. And for whatever reason, the good Lord gave me the brain that went, this bullshit is not me. <gasps> that ain't me. Um, wow. That is, people go to 12-step programs for dozens of years to reach that point, to find that. Well, I had some of it. I had mm -hmm. some of the like, I'm, I'm not lovable stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I had the like, I don't deserve love because mm -hmm. the one person who's supposed to love you didn't know how. Yeah. And that kind of small, young kid. But I remember being like seven or eight years old and my mom actively like very vocally lying to someone about something big in front of me and me going, oh, you're really screwed up. <gasps> That's really bad. Wow. And then, you know, other questionable sociopathic type behavior where I just went, Time out. That's not, no, 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 no. So then now when you're telling me I'm fat and ugly, I'm not buying it. Right. Because you just you, lied and you just stole that and you just fucked that person over. So you're doing that to me. Wow. That's so really, 
intellig- emotionally intelligent. I think like, I was just lucky. Like you're talking about yeah, you got your dad's legs. You, just, you got a brain that could process this Somehow. stuff and not take it personally Somehow. and figure it out. Do you have siblings? No. Wow. Thank that God. is really impressive that you were able to put that all together. I think I just had a really strong sense of right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, easy. The, the, the stuff that screwed with my head was mm-hmm. more like emotional of the, the, my mom's not, but like my mom, part of her personality disorder, if I did something wrong, she would literally excommunicate me for like a year. Not, not for like, Oh, go to your room and I'll talk to you after dinner. No, no, no. Wait, like, that's a kid? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like what kind of thing would set her off to, to, to um, do that? Well, um, the, the first time she really, really excommunicated, I was 13 and my parents had divorced when I was seven. And I'd always told her I was moving with my dad, but 13, you could choose mm-hmm. and where you wanted to live. So I, I always told her that. And so when I moved to my dad, she didn't talk to me for about a year and a half. Oh my God. She just was like, then a uh, goodbye. And you're dead to me. And I don't want to know you. And bye. Oh. And then never, she just this kind of- poor woman. Yeah, this poor woman is exactly right. Like what the fuck did, was her childhood like? I'm it, guessing- It was pretty, pretty rough. Pretty bad. Yeah. So so that's mm. that's the first one that's that big, Yeah. you know? But she did leave for about a year and a half when I was four, but that didn't have anything to do with me. She just left. She was doing, you know, being crazy lady. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, in between when there was an argument or a fight where I did something wrong, it definitely was like, I can't even, I can't, you're like, mm. you smell bad, you look bad, and I'm not even gonna. Mm-mm. She like Scientology you, like when it's a yeah. person. Like, like you're- excommunicated, like you're done. <sighs> So, yeah. So it's just a weird, I think 13. So some of that, some of that emotional part as a young adult, I had to really unravel. How did you do that? How did you eventually feel lovable? Did you get therapy before birth though? Like, oh yeah. Okay. So you were, you were on the mend when you met Bert and cause I'm like, how would you let that love in? Because he well, loves you. He does. And I love him very yeah, much. Yeah, he and, loves you. No, oh, I love him so much. Yeah, we it's have like a great it's relationship. So just, you really do. And it's it's so, but that's not easy to accept that after you've had that kind of childhood. To, no, so that I- That would usually I had, scare someone. I had like two, it did scare me. I was in therapy for three years when I was in my early 20s. I didn't meet Bert I was 31. Mm-hmm. Um, and in those early 20s, I just figured out that all this childhood trauma was what I was basing a lot of decisions on. And those decisions were bringing me unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to go back and figure out why I kept making decisions based on bad information, really. I just treated it kind of like a math problem, I think. Oh my God. So I just went, well, if my mom treated me in a way that made me feel like I didn't deserve to be alive even, uh, that's her problem. So let's go back. And when you start thinking those thoughts in your brain, correct yourself. Don't do that anymore. Recognize when you're starting to walk down the path of you don't deserve whatever it is and stop yourself and course correct. And I did that partly by being in therapy and partly I started collecting um, sayings and um, quotes and song lyrics and poetry and something someone said to me that resonated in a book that I call my Bible. So I just started writing all this shit down. That was my barometer. Hmm. So that was like, no, 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 this is what you want your essence to be. Yes. So all that bad information you got from her, I can replace with what's in this book. And would you just look through it? And it was almost like- I still add to it today. I wow. still have it. I still add to it. I started it um, in 1996. Oh my God. So you just, add, it's like positive affirmations, writing these it's positive things everything. all the time. And like some when you have a negative the, thing going, no, go it's back okay to that, that you had book. that, but let's like, let's uh-huh. know that that's not the right thing. Because uh-huh. I think that's where people get into trouble is that I'll have a negative thought and I'll stay with it. And I'll think that's, that's right. Because you don't have something to replace it with because yeah. you have to replace that programming. That right. You can't just erase it. That's not how your brain works. You have to replace it. Yeah. So some of it was affirmations, but some of it was like literally like lyrics to a song that I'd heard on the radio where I went, oh my God, this is what I 
this is part of my path. So I'm going to write that down. And then even I just read through the whole Bible the other day. I just went through it and it was like, some of it is completely obsolete for me today. Okay. It's nothing yeah. I would never need to hear today. But I remember feeling those things or having those damages sort yeah. of at that time and how necessary some of that wisdom was. So I did that in my 20s. But then when I started falling for Bert, when I started going, oh, this might be, he was not like anybody I'd ever dated before. I always dated really kind of like super safe, really predictable, um, really reliable, really straight arrow dudes. Um, <laughs> and then- You never dated any comedians or- Nobody that was- Like, no. Just, bo you were bored. I was totally bored. Those, I was running people. in and out of relationships like three, four months mm -hmm. and going, I don't understand why I can't find anybody because I was looking at the wrong ball game. Uh -huh. right? So um, when I finally met him and I was like, okay, I think this may be the direction I have to go. I got back into therapy because my mom's been divorced six times. My dad's been divorced twice. I don't have any roadmap for a successful relationship. And I, I did grow up feeling like, hey, if, if something goes wrong, they just leave. Like, that's the example I had. Yeah. Was that you just bail. That's what you do. And I was like, well, I will not do that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that for my own life. Wow. So, so you... I got back into therapy. And I'm still with the same therapist. I went with her and I was like, I found this guy. He is not a regular human being. He is... How did you guys meet again? We met bowling. Okay. We are mutual friends. We all went bowling. Okay. Um, I was like, he's just not a regular guy and I don't know how to do this. So I'm going to need a lot of help. And I'm really glad I've stayed with her because in the beginning of our relationship, it was a lot of healing for me. A lot of like, the fight happens. A fight is healthy if the fight is handled properly. It's mm -hmm. good. It's good for you to stand up for yourself. It's good for him to stand up for and for you to understand each other better. And then you move on from that. You know, you have a little break and then it builds back stronger. A little break, it builds back stronger. And she would help me with that. And, you know, he's he's so emotional, reactive, um, ruminatory, if that's even a word, yeah. that I needed someone to go, this fucking guy, if he tells me one more time, let's talk about being sober, I'm going to jump off the building. Yeah. I, I need someone to just let me dump my frustration so that I can be a partner to him in the way that makes me proud. It's not even what he needs per se, it's what I need to be for that other person. Right. Right. It's a standard I've set for myself. Um, and, and it's a care I have for that relationship that I decided to sign up for. So what do you, when he's having these uh, internal and external monologues, struggles with the drinking stuff, what is, what's your course of action when you do feel like, shut the fuck up? Like in the moment, yeah, I have to take a deep breath and just my objective is just to be completely open and listen. And to listen as much as he needs to be listened to. And no, Thursday morning at eight, I can call and go, if he tells me this one more time, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to die. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I know that I have relief, right? Did you need him to go to therapy at any point? Oh, yeah. Was that a, a requisite for you? Did it get to that oh, point yeah. where you were like, we can't do this unless you... Because I, I can't be the only thing. You're only sounding bored. Um, it yes. It was um, after the Travel Channel. He was suffering from PTSD. And I was talking to my therapist going... From what? Like, from falling off a waterfall, from jumping oh, from off like the roof of the stadium. The thing, doing the From things. thinking he was going to die three days a week. He thought he was going to die. He was oh called... Nikki, God. he would call... He would hide. Oh. He would hide on set and call me and go, I'm definitely dying today. I'm 100%. I'm not coming home today. I'm going to die. And I'd be like, you know, you're like bungee jumping. Like uh, five million people have done this. But he felt like he was dying on yeah, a, there was a regular basis on. Oh my God. for six years. Oh my so God. At the very end of the Travel Channel, he actually legitimately <sighs> fell off a 15 foot waterfall, landed on his back. The guy that was carrying, was holding like the safety rope just wasn't paying attention and he landed on his back no medic had to crawl out of the forest and be airlifted to the hospital and he had a little bit of a break at that point but the break had been coming um 
and I had been watching him react to things in our regular life that was so abnormal that I kept going, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go to therapy and talk about it. And he had been saying to me for probably about six months, I think he has PTSD and I think you need to get him some help. So I'd never told him, my therapist thinks you have PTSD because that's never going to go over well. Mm -hmm. But I kept saying to him, I think this is above my pay grade. Like the stuff you keep bringing to me is is beyond my expertise as a human being. Like, I think you need to talk to a professional. And then we went on a little family vacation with four families, with, with four families went together. I hope not to Niagara Falls or something. Nope, we went to Yosemite. Okay. And we were staying at a house that had a little pond that we were fishing. And uh, I was baiting a hook and Bert was all the way up at the house and just started literally in front of our kids screaming at me to get my ass in the house now. And I go in the house and he goes, how dare you bait that hook? How dare you emasculate me that way in front of our children? And I went, okay, dude has left the building. Right. I do this not know what is happening. So out of character. Something is happening. Yeah. This is not okay. Aww. So we got, I just made it through the trip. I tried to like make everything okay. And ha ha, yuck, yuck. So fun. So funny. Dad's so kooky. And that next day, uh, that shortly after he went on the road for stand up, and he called me from the road. And I, cause I could not have this conversation with him in person. It was too confrontational. Yeah. I said, uh, you've got to get some help. What happened while we were at Yosemite is not normal for you. This is yeah. so out of character for you that you are off in a ditch in a way that I can't get you back on the road. So, um, uh, how do you feel about that? And he said, I think you may be right. So th- the next day I had him a therapist. Wow. And he started working with that doctor. That doctor, this is way before the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, actually treated uh, patients uh, via Skype. And I was like, the only way it's going to work is if I get somebody that can do it remotely because he's never home. Right. And so that doctor diagnosed him with PTSD shortly I after. No idea. That makes yeah. so much sense. I mean, it was Poor nutty. Bert. Poor Bert. He was suffering. He was suffering <coughs> so deeply. Um, and but how it's really hard to go, watch? How good of you to not say what the? I mean, I'm sure everything in you was like, "What the fuck, man? Like, don't talk to me like that." Like, I was. Yeah. How dare you? Like, and just like, who is this guy I'm even married to? Like, for me, in my head, I'm like, I'd want to like leave and be like, "Well, then, fuck you." This is. But you just had the. You knew something was obviously wrong. This well, wasn't the person. Because I was in therapy. Yeah. So I was talking to this woman who had been with me with him from the beginning. And had given you like kind of a, the warnings, like, hey, he yes. might have this thing. Yes. And then, and, and then it was, yes. that need, that bait situation had to happen. I think it did for him to be able to, to identify. Because I'm sure it was so himself. embarrassing once he calmed down. Right. Of he had that, no that explosion. Me- well, how, <gasps> how we knew it was PTSD for sure is he had no memory of that conversation at all. Oh, he was cu- it was and he wasn't even drinking. It was like he blacked out, mm. but he wasn't drinking because he was on medication from the waterfall fall. Right. So he he and he wasn't over medicating. He was taking he's really scared of prescription medication. So he takes it like as prescribed. So he wasn't like overdosing on Xanax. Yeah. That wasn't happening. He had a true moment of a little bit of a break. Hmm. He had no memory that happened at all. When I when I told him about it, I was like, do you remember yelling at me about baiting a hook? And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I went, yeah, that's, dude, you got to go get some. Oh, this is not okay anymore. It just sounds like he respects you so much and, and needs you so much. And um, and that you guys have, that's such an amazing partnership that he wasn't, didn't get extremely defensive. And it's clearly he needed, he needs someone to step in and say like, you're going to lose it all if you don't do something. And... Yeah, well, so for me, he, during that time, I was going, I can't have my kids in this environment. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not, I would never have thought of leaving him, but I definitely thought to myself, if this is where we're going, I got to get my kids out of here. Because yeah. I can't have my kids, because that's what I grew up in, was yeah. someone reacting to something that wasn't real and reacting in a way <sighs> that was so extreme that, you know, a, a level three thing 
was like a 13. Where you're like, it's really just a three, but maybe it is a 13 and it makes you question reality a lot. Wow. And so I saw that happening and went, my kids will not be dealing with that. No way. So you got to freaking get some shit together because I'm not going to have my kids have to deal with that. That's so, not fair to <sighs> them. How, uh, do you, I, I guess my question for you is like, how, how do you deal with your daughters being uh, teenagers now in college? Are they both in college now? Just one. Just one. H- how do you deal with them having, do they have insecurities? Do they have, you know, with social media how do you handle having teenage girls and how have they, because you seem still so close to them. I'm sure they went through this awkward teenage phase of shut up, mom. I hate like those kind of things. But like, it seems like it's been a lovely time for you. Like if, if I look at your family and go, oh, I would want daughters. And other people are like, oh, daughters, you know, because of that time. But your daughters seem like you're still having fun with them at this kind of age where most people feel a, a, a divide. How do you manage that? I don't know. I really don't. (laughs) I don't know. Um, I think, first of all, we have two really good human beings. We just got really lucky. lucky. Yeah. Yes. And that we got two really good human beings. It is kind of just luck. I mean, they could. Some of it's luck. Yes. Some of it is about boundaries. Mm. Some of it is about respecting yourself and, and respecting your spouse in front of your kids so that they don't do that. My kids have not really ever done that. Shut up, mom. Yell at really? you. No, no, no. They don't talk like that to us. Really? And if they ever get yelly. What about when you bait a hook? Just kidding. <laughs> right? Well, we haven't tried that, but we could. Um, they, they don't get yelly with us much. And if they do, we'll stop it immediately. Do not talk. Well, I don't talk to you that way. So you don't talk to me. Good. Either. And so okay. they do that. Well, well, I'm, just, I'm really good at boundaries. Yeah. Um, with that, I think that has something to do with it. Yeah. As I watch peers with their kids, I go. There's a lot of eye rolling of like, there she goes. Instead of like, no. Yeah. Well, come back not, here. I don't do that to you. Right. You know, I've always well, that's tried the difference. To, yeah. If you don't do that to them. Yeah. They don't really learn it from any. Like they might see their their peers do it. They might see it on TV, but they're not seeing you do it. Right. And I'm thinking when I yelled at my mom she would yell at me that way. So it's like, I learned it from you, mom, kind of thing. So I think that is, as long as you don't talk to them that way, Mm -hmm. you do have always that that ground that you can stand of like, listen, I'm not doing it to you. And how do you not do it to your therapy? Therapy's part of it. Therapy's part of it in my Bible. And I I just try to go, I try to treat them the way I would want to be treated. You know, I don't want to be yelled at. Golden rule, yeah. I mean, I don't like that. So I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So you, li- I mean, I'd say so much of parenting is example. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Yes. It's your behavior, it's how you present yourself, it's how you behave in your life with your friends, with your, with the cashier at Target. Like you said, because you, know? you would observe your mom doing shitty Being things. Being insane. And you would, you knew what kind of person she was. You were paying attention and you know from your own experience that the kids pay attention. So you have Absolutely. to hold yourself to that standard, yes. not lie in front of them, not, right. you know, shoplift. Walk your, walk your walk and, and talk your talk mm-hmm. and be that and then that sets the standard for them to be that. No, well, they're right? amazing. Thank you. They really are. They're so Thank special. You. And like, I don't want kids, but if I did. You don't want kids? I don't think so. No. At least, you know, I think that I'd be open to it if I had a partner who was like, I want kids and like was really psyched about being a dad. But my boyfriend now is like, we could. I'm like, I, I need someone who's like, because I'm on the fence. We can't have two people on the fence. No, yeah. And I would be, ama- I would rise to the occasion and be amazing at it, I'm sure. But I, it's, um, it's just something I, um, you know, I'm 39 now, so it's kind of like, okay. And I didn't freeze my eggs. So I would, it would be probably an adoption route for me at this point, which is nice to always have that in my back pocket. Like I could do that, yeah. but I don't know if it's in the cards for me, but I do, um, yeah, I, I look at your family. I very much admire it. Aww, and it, it, I think that once my parents die, it's going to be that like, oh, fuck. I got to make a family because right now I still feel like a daughter. Yeah. And there's no, there's no room for me to be a mother because I'm still, I'm still a daughter. Right. You know, like my family is still very much intact the way it was as I was a kid. And I think it will shift. 
Which is also adorable, it by is. the way. And it's it's so great. And I, I love that your dad's on stage with you too. Yeah, I bring him on the road because I feel like he really could have been a successful singer, songwriter, musician, but he didn't go that route because he had a family and wanted us to ha- be financially secure. And so it's like, um, it's like reverse nepotism. Like um, he's, I'm not a nepo baby, but he's a nepo daddy, I guess. <laughs> I just, I want, I want him to maybe have a name for himself now. And I'm performing on these stages that are like, it's incredible getting to perform at theaters. And and yeah. so to give him that stage time and that experience, uh, it's a little bit of a make-a-wish for my day. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly awesome what though. Winner. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> and I enjoy their company so much. I yeah. learned so much from them. I don't have that bitterness that I had, I think, in my teens and into my 20s when I started going to therapy and figuring out it's all your fault. Like, right. I've re- released all of that. I forgive them. I, I just love them. I think yeah. they're they're like my, I they're my friends. I, I, I feel as close to them as I see your daughters are with you guys. And um, yeah, it's just nice that they're still with it. And I can't wait to like live with them. Like I can't wait till they're dependent on me in that way Aww. that they move in kind of thing. That's adorable. Yeah. And, and I think I work for them too. Like I think a lot of people work once they have families to provide for their kids. And I'm, I just want to, I'm not worried about getting my kids into college. I'm worried about getting my parents into a great nursing home. Right. Like yeah. I just want them to be That's well great. taken care of. And it's, 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 yeah. But I am very scared for when they pass because I, I think I will scramble then to dr- drum up some sort of egg in my body. <laughs> like, some egg. Just somebody some give me an egg. egg. Yeah. Whitney may have a couple extra. I know she does. Yeah, like she's, go. she's got them on ice. I take a Whitney egg there for sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> With that bone structure. Uh, sure. Tell me about it. <laughs> right. It's similar height, you guys. So <laughs> there you go. You got that in common. Yeah. I loved your last special. Oh, thank you so much. I loved it. Thank you. Bert and I watched it together and I was like, oh, she is so talented. It meant so much to me to get that text from you. It was seriously, I'll never forget it. You know, it's like you get a lot of attention for these things, but it's like, you know, the wife of a stand-up comedian who's seen so much comedy, <laughs> been forced to sit in the back of the room and watch countless to stand out to someone like that. And for you to write me that text when... You know, it, I would have never expected it. it like it really stuck Aww. out to me and, and and meant something. So thank you so much. Oh, well, and I'm making I'm doing a new one. You are coming up. So I expect another text. You will get next one. year because, <laughs> you know, I will watch it. I'm, I'm a huge fan this one of with you in mind. I'm like, what would Leon like? Good. Perfect. That's yeah. perfect. Just for me. <laughs> How did you like doing the mass Singer? I loved it. Did you? Because I love singing and I'm embarrassed that I like it so much. And it's a very sincere thing to do. And I think as comedians, we don't like to be sincere and emotional. We have to make everything a joke. So I've always felt insecure about wanting to be a singer. Um, but I got to do it in a mask. So no one knew it was me. No one was like, oh, Nikki Glazer's trying to sing. That's so embarrassing. I was like this, you know, snowflake. Yeah. So I just got to I could have been anyone underneath there. If I could do my whole life mass, <laughs> I would be really, I would be very successful. I, you know, I'm very successful, but I'd be successful in a different way because it's that, you know, it's that superpower of not caring what people think about you because I wasn't anyone. I right. was just this snowflake character. So it was like, I didn't have an ego about it. If it sounded bad, who cares? Yes, I'm going to be on mass, but by the time I'm on mass, people will. I forgot. I'm not singing while I'm on mass. Yeah. Like they can't associate it with it. Yeah. So it was a really cool experience, experiment of trying to go through life like I'm masked. Like stop worrying about that people know this is you. Like who cares? And um, and it got me into singing again and and realizing like oh I do have like a talent for this. Like people didn't know it was me and people. I went pretty far in it, you know? And so it gave me that confidence that I was talking about earlier of like, hey, you're pretty good at this. Like there was, you know, I always thought like if I started singing now and release music, people would probably listen because it's Nikki Glaser, the comedian. This is interesting. But I I always thought I want to do it anonymously to see if I could have a career in this without any start, like without any like little boost from my celebrity. And it gave me that confidence. So it's like, it's nice to have a new goal in life because comedy, I still have goals within comedy, but you know, when you reach a certain level of success, it's kind of all the same. And, um, and you just are like, okay, I've got this. Like I, I nailed this. Let's, what, what else can I do? And so, um, it's nice to be pursuing something else. Like I'm young again. It makes me feel young again to be bad at something. And so I take voice lessons twice a week and I take guitar lessons and I'm That's learning. Awesome. 
songs from 13 year olds on YouTube and it's just, it's humbling, but it's, it's fun to do something new. That's and, so cool. Yeah. And to like think, oh, maybe in like 10 years, like with stand up, I could be really, really good at this, right. but I need to give myself that time. I can't compare myself to Taylor Swift. Right. She started way before me. And, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. But The Masked Singer was awesome. I love any kind of um, sh show like that. That's just, uh, you know, that's, I think, F-Boy Island, Mass Singer, Dancing with the Stars. Like, I like doing, even, I remember Bert asking me to do something for, I think it was the Travel Channel show. And I, it was like some kind of bungee jumping thing. And I was like, that's, I don't know that I'd do that, though. Right? That's really scary to me. Yeah. Um, but thank you. it's 110. Oh, thank you. What do you oh, say? It's 110. Yeah. Oh, you're um, hard out, don't yeah, you? Yeah, sorry. Okay, we'll wrap it off. That's okay. Yeah, I might be getting a dog today. What? So I'm planning my whole day around What kind of dog? In. It's a little rescue dog that has one eye, which I wanted a dog that's like kind of fucked up looking that no one else wants, even though I think a one-eyed dog is something that people would want. Uh -huh. So I'm meeting a dog with one, three legs and then another dog with one eye. Oh and I think together they make a whole dog. But um, Are you going to yeah. take them both? I'm going to get one. I want to, I think I'm ready to, I have a maternal instinct that's not being met right now yeah. with kids. And so I think that it's time to have a, like, honestly, an emotional support animal. I'm Aww. on the road a lot. I, I'm, I think I'm kind of realizing I need a little help and I need a little like love and I need something that doesn't care what I look like. And like that kind of unconditional love constantly by my side. And I'm a little scared about it because it's just more work in my life. And, but it's a reason to get up in the morning when I'm having days off where I just want to sleep and sleep and sleep. Like yeah. I'm ready for a new responsibility. A little bit of responsibility. Yeah. Have you so, ever had a dog before? Yes. And then I moved, I had it here when I lived here and then I moved to New York and it was such a small apartment that I was like, I can't, this is not a good life for these dogs. So they now live with, I give them to my parents just temporarily. And then they fell in love with them and they didn't give of them course. back. So yeah. Now I'm like, okay, I got to get another dog. My mom's like, we can't take another dog. And I'm like, so this one has to be mine. I can't, you know, surrender them to my parents. And yeah, it's it's such, it's it's so crazy that in two hours, I might have a, a an animal that I'll have for, I think it's four years old. So at least have for 10 years. Yeah. Well, if you adopt this dog, will you send me a picture? Oh my God, I totally will. Please. I will, yeah. I'm I can't so wait. excited. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, we'll see. <sighs> well, let's get you out of here to get your dog. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you, well, so, thank you so for much. coming. Oh, thank you. Thanks I for love chatting with you. I so love easy. hanging with you too. I learned so much. Thank you for oh, thank you for always being so honest about your relationship and like your struggles. And it's just like I think that's another thing that I really admire about you and Bird is that you talk so openly about what you've been through and what you're, you are currently going through. And it's just so refreshing to people. I don't think you guys get enough credit for Aww. you put yourselves out there so much and you get a lot of scrutiny. I'm sure because of it, but. Most people don't do that. Most people don't let people in to their lives as much as you have. And I think it's helped so many people. And um, I was just sitting here listening to you tell me about the, the fishing story. I'm just like, God, we're so lucky that someone is sharing this intimate moment of their life to someone is watching this being like, oh, this has happened to me. And I was so ashamed of it. I'd never talk about it. So it's really cool that you're so cool. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Great example. I think we're on the planet to help each other, aren't we? Yes. And uh, Bert and I have a pretty regular marriage. I mean, it's exceptional in that it's successful. And, yes. But other than that, we're really pretty regular people. And I think um, we can all learn from each other on the planet. And why, why be secretive about things that could help other people or things that set you free by just talking about it. Totally. You know, that's the way I live my life. And, and yeah. I feel embarrassed sometimes. Like I said too much, but uh, it's no, it's, it's nice to see someone else do it. Well, so thank, thank you. you for the yeah. compliment and thank you for coming. Yeah, I'm so glad you. to see you, Nikki, and send me a picture of that you dog. Too. I will. <laughs> oh, one eye. Oh, one eye.